1983, IBM introduced the 5160, also known as the XT. It was only a small upgrade over the original 5150 hardware, but it wasn't long before people started to make copies of it with increasing success. Today, we'll look at one such machine. Hello everyone, I'm High Treason. Very long time no see. It's a long, boring, bloody story. You can at least see the room's been moved around. Not done yet. Still a metric ton of cables and shit to sort out. We're well, most of the way there. I'm taking time off from it because I'm sick of it. But yeah, um, Tybo XT. We're going to look at that today. It's uh, probably the oldest machine by design that I've, uh, that I've looked at on this channel, but not the oldest machine by actual age, going by like manufactured date. It's going to be a long one anyway, so uh, strap yourselves on and uh, enjoy it, I guess, or don't. That's down to you, I suppose. It's entirely subjective, this shit, isn't it? Let's just get on with it. I find out the audio is dodgy. Starting at the front of the chassis, we have a big, full-height IBM floppy drive with IBM branding on it. As such, this might be made by Tandem. Tampon. There's not much else, just the LEDs and switches, though this one labelled Tarbo is rather important, as this is supposed to be a Tarbo XT, and it probably wouldn't be if it didn't have that. We can see the cost cutting already, because they didn't want to modify their existing chassis to have a third LED, and so they just installed a button that had one built in. It works. There's nothing on the left of the chassis, but the right side has one of these big power switches that always makes me nervous. I'm not sure why, but I always feel like these massive things are going to snap off, even though I can't remember ever seeing this happen. The back of the chassis is far more interesting, at least to us, I suppose. For a start, we have the big power supply, just like IBM's, what well, might be an IBM one, though there are a few issues with it that we'll get into later. The keyboard port looks normal, and in a way it sort of is, but there's a major caveat if you want to get into these machines, which again, we'll cover later on. Being a PC from the 80s, this thing needs expansion cards to really do much of anything. So to start with, we have what looks like a blank slot, but is actually a drive controller, well, host adapter. Then we have what looks like an I.O. card, but with an extra feature we can't see from here, followed by a floppy controller with the big 60-pin, I think, connector for external drives, an actual blank slot, game port that hangs off the I.O. card, ad-lib clone we've seen before, a very budget-conscious serial port that hangs off the I.O. card again, and lastly, probably a CGA card, depending on what I filmed this. It's supposed to be anywhere. To that end, I will get it out of the way now. This machine usually does have the CGA card installed, but for some of this video, I might have switched to EGA or VGA at any given time, so I don't think I'm using some magic CGA card that does all these weird modes. I'm not, and the one I adore you in is, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, it's actually a piece of shit, in all honesty, the one that's in there. <laughs> it's not very good. I don't care. And uh, anyways, on that note, we'd better open the chassis, because you know as well as I do that that's where all the fun stuff is. I make hardware pornography, and what good is a porno if nobody takes their claws off? The cover slides along each side just like a girl's knickers down both her legs, but far less arousing to watch and with a feeling like dragging your nails over a chalkboard because this thing's cheaply made and the tolerances aren't actually all that good. And immediately we're staring at the IBM tape power supply. We didn't get the smaller AT style power supplies until quite a while after the XT and I can't remember ever finding out who did them first. As while we call them AT power supplies, the IBM 5170, which was the AT, still had a larger one akin to this power supply. That was more powerful though. Well, this one is only a 63 watt unit, like the IBM 5150 had, it's certainly a potential problem. Also, this one's 110 volt only, so I have to use a step down transformer because I'm in the UK, and maybe because I live very close to a power station, my line voltage can go over 260 volts at times. Yeah, I really don't know where the smaller power supply started, maybe in the PS2 line or something. I've never been able to find a definitive answer. If you know, by all means, do, do inform me. 
The motherboard is a decent size, about that of a full-length baby AT, but that's another kind of retronym that I'm not so sure of at this point. It's made by DTK and is a PIM640 or PIM Tabo, depending on where you read it. I believe Ancient Electronics owns a system both in the same case and with the 10 MHz version of this board. Although I think his case stick is a different brand to my Dow International Products one which sounds very Taiwanese. I mean, it is a Taiwanese machine, but then some sources say it might be designed in Saudi Arabia. I, I don't know. To be honest, neither of the machines are much different to the IBM original, using almost identical layouts and silk screens. It does have an advantage, though, in that it can run all 640k of RAM without requiring modifications, and this one is doing just that. In fact, this is why I bought the system complete, as buying a motherboard and RAM in my own country was more expensive than importing a complete system from the United States for some reason, hence the 110 volt power supply. This happens quite a lot. I don't know. It's, it's this continent. It's broken. People either don't want to sell things that they say they're selling, or else they'll ask a ridiculous price in the vain hopes that it doesn't sell, because they've told me openly several times that it is just not convenient to them to sell the thing that they've bothered to list on eBay, or in a newspaper, or at a goddamn market stall. It, it's a European mentality, I swear. I never have this problem with people from other countries and other continents, because, as I say, this, this spreads across Europe. It's not just the UK. So, y y anyways, we, we have 640k of RAM, which is actually quite a lot for an XT system, as they're often sold with considerably less than this. I mean, the board can actually be set to run on only 64k. I'm not really sure what that's useful for, because, uh, you, well, maybe you could run ROM Basic in that. To which end, you will notice that there is this row of unpopulated ROM sockets, and... Well, yeah, that's where ROM Basic would go. Could probably run ROM DOS. I haven't been able to find that. I'd like to give it a go if anyone knows where I can find some bin files for that or a tool to make a build of it somehow. I'd be quite interested to give it a go, especially if I could still use my hard drive. But back on the RAM, that's also where most of the power's going, as each RAM chip can actually draw some way over a watt of power, and there are 36 of the bloody things. So total power draw for the memory can be anywhere from 25 to maybe 35 watts, depending on how much you're hammering it. And it's about a third to a half of the power supply's capacity. It would also have been the bulk of the cost of the system at one time, because DRAM's pretty expensive, even when it's slow. I mean, what is this, 150 nanosecond? You know, it's funny, I noticed the uh, 70 nanosecond stuff... Sort of the speed of that comes quite close to the 14.318 megahertz master clock's actually slightly slower. I think it's about 14.1. Yeah, that clock's its own thing. We'll get there soon. In any case, it is just standard DRAM. It doesn't have the fast page feature that some later systems offered. Though you can usually use those dips in these systems. And there's a lot of those. A CMOS, they made them into the 90s, so you can find them. They might run colder, they'll use less power, and probably have better tolerance for these wacky turbo clock speeds if you're having problems with these. So, yeah, I mean, you, you should probably check the data sheet, but I've swapped the two types around without issue. Of course, you can't use a fast page feature, the system doesn't support it, but it'll work as regular DRAM just fine. And, as I say, less power draw, less heat. It might be worth doing in some situations if you're having issues with that. Good luck figuring out which chip's defective if one of them breaks. Well, actually, it tells you what address, so usually you can figure it out pretty fast. Otherwise, you just set it to 64K and keep swapping them around until you find the system stops working, you know which IC it is. Imagine if we still had to do it this way now with such low capacities, what PCs would look. It'd be ridiculous. I mean, nowadays you don't have the incentive to do it this way because RAM sticks are comparatively cheap. Whereas back then, a single IC cost a lot of money, and if it broke, it was cheaper to just replace that one IC. So, it was worth putting the sockets on. Now, I know we'd usually move on to the expansion cards now, but not just yet, because the motherboard is really, by far, one of the most intriguing parts of this machine. I mean, it's not a special board, but you see, we've gotten used to these later machines, where more and more of the board logic got moved into the chipset, and even later, into the CPU. Yes, thanks, AMD, with your early Athlon 64s, leaving me on DDR1, when all the Intels went on DDR2 and ran rings around it, unless you believe the couple of rigged benchmarks. 
I think Everett's benchmark was one of the most rigged ones because you know DDR1 like three or four times faster than like six eight hundred megahertz DDR2 of course. Oh, also we didn't have uh, PCI Express on early Athon 64s either, so yeah, get a look with the upgrade path on those. You buy expensive ATI GPUs and they fucking work in OpenGL. I was off it by then, wasn't our problem. Now, did, 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 anyway, this, this one doesn't do any stupid things like integrating logic in CPUs. You can see quite clearly how the PC actually works. It's like the computer equivalent of one of those little model engines you can build, where it isn't all that useful to earn necessarily, compared with, say, just going and buying a generic two-stroke engine or something, but you can see how it all functions inside. You can see it working, and that, it's fascinating in its own right. Of course, you have all the regular stuff, like the empty FPU socket and the 8088 CPU, and this next bit's going to be a bastard to film, because to accompany that we have the 8284A clock generator, with the A signifying 8 megahertz. We can clearly see the 8288 bus control, there we go, the 8255 peripheral interface, the 8237 DMA controller, the 8259 IQ controller, the 8253 programmable interval timer, and of course, all the many pieces of generic glue logic that hold the whole thing together and make it fucking work. You can quite literally see the architecture of the PC just playing out on the motherboard before you. And I really like that. I think we've we've lost something among the Earth's chipsets. are a fucking brilliant thing and I love them, but it doesn't look as cool as this, does it? Let's be honest. Even though this is all just plastics, well, most. There's a bit of ceramic in there, but it's a cost-cutting machine. They were going to use much plastic as they could, and I think some of these ICs might actually be relabeled marginal things that it. it's doing its job. Of course, machines like this one do deviate from IBM's specification a little, because the original XT only ran at 4.77 MHz, just like the original PC. Turbo XTs are where the clone makers really started to get the hang of things, when the white box machines kind of became viable and started to slowly transcend being simple clones and move towards being compatibles. Yeah, this one still largely looks like and works like the IBM 5160 did, but it's things like the clock boost and memory support where you can see the off-brand systems starting to run off on their own with their own ideas, even if only a little, and, well, certainly the lower price point they might have been able to sell it at, and these extra features are probably enough to sell some units and get a foothold. It, it certainly had an effect. Now, what you might have caught, and this will lead into the expansion cards at long last soon, I promise, is that we only have one 8237 and 8259. I mean, of course we do, because we only have 8-bit ISA slots, and they weren't even called ISA slots yet, they were just the PC expansion bus, really, or names similar to that. We do have 8 of them on here, though, and that was one of the advantages of XT machines, as the original PC 5150 only had 5. The problem start, we want to have all of these cards in, as we have quite a few limitations at hand. I mean, before we even begin to do outlandish things, there's a power limit on what you can drive on the cards, and that, that exists on any machine that the bus only has so much power to drive other things. I mean, you have buffers and shit to get you out of trouble, but you can run into issues with this if you stuff a lot of things in there. Also, we only have IRQs and four DMAs, and we can't even use some of them. Several are either used by the system or assumed to be a given thing, which might not be a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. The 8253 is on IRQ0, and it acts as a system timer, as well as driving the internal speaker. So we can't use the IRQ for any add-ons, and we can't really run the system without that component. It's not even socketed. The keyboard lives on IRQ1, and yeah, we can't do anything about that. The video card might use IRQ2 for vertical retrace, so be mindful of that. You can quite often disable it and get away with it on VGA cards at least. It's hardwired on some, and on EGA cards I think it's always on. I'm not actually sure on that. The floppy controller is on IRQ6, and the machine won't like starting without that. It doesn't expect that. We could possibly disable LPT ports, but they'll be on IRQ5 and 7. 
and there's a curious thing with the address of those that we'll get to shortly. Incidentally, you'll notice that the LPT port is often part of the video card in these older machines, and I think this came about in part due to the original 5150's limited number of slots. And the thing to be mindful of here is that the first parallel port is actually at 3BC and not 378 when that parallel port is on a video card a lot of the time. So, yeah, when you're dealing with later expansion cards, there may be something to think about. If your video card doesn't have a, a thing there, then, well, 378 would be LPT2. And I recently ran into this issue on my 286 where... I had to set a port to LPT2 to make it effectively what LPT1 would be expected to be at 378 in later tools and stuff. No big deal, but just something to keep in the back of your head that 1 and 3 swapped around generally because the parallel port vanished off the video card and everything else was built around the expectation it might have been there. In any case, we were talking about interrupts and at most we probably have three IRQs free in most systems then. But IRQ 3 and 4 are generally assumed to be COM ports, so we can't necessarily use them for other peripherals. It sucks, but assumptions are kind of good sometimes. Again, we're going to come back to this. In the meantime, for DMA, the DRAM is using DMA0 for its refresh, the flop is using DMA2, and this leaves us with only DMA1 and 3 for use by expansions. Now, you might be able to get a machine to run without a floppy controller, but pretty much nothing else will even have the option of using IRQ6, as it really is assumed to always be said floppy controller and nothing else. And there we go with the assumptions again. There are several of these, and it's actually where you start getting into dodgy things, like the science of machines that used 8088s or 8086 and derivative processors, but weren't really PC compatible. I mean, you could put any peripheral or feature at just about any address, interrupts, and DMA in theory and have it work, but how would you write a program for that? If your program only talks to the operating system, and all of those machines ran the same operating system with the same APIs, then it might just work if you were only talking to the APIs. I think something like this might have gone on with machines that ran CPM, and IBM even offered that operating system as an option for the PC at one time. But CPM or DOS, in this era it was quite normal for applications to try talking directly to the hardware in one way or another. And so those mutually understood assumptions we mentioned were a good thing, and part of what made the machine PC compatible or not. I mean, imagine you wanted to write a program that talked to the serial port, probably to use a modem or something. I mean, even an internal modem is really just a serial port as far as the PC is concerned. You have an IBM branded PC with that interface at address 3F8 on IRQ4, COM1's IRQ4, COM2's IRQ3. Don't make the mistake of setting those the wrong way around, I've done it and I've seen loads of people do it. But anyways, any other supposed PC could have those interfaces somewhere else. And how do you go about writing your program? Do you prompt the user for this information who probably has no idea what any of it means? Do you write many different versions of the program for every type of PC with its own way of doing it, or do you try and detect the port? The latter sounds very nice, but what if something else is there that responds similarly to a serial port, or even causes the system to crash when it's probed in such a way? It's not really a good idea, and it's much better then to just assume that these bread and butter things are always going to be in the same place, both in hardware and software, and that's why we can't just stuff things on any old interrupt or DMA or address, even if they're not in use, as well as being why our Turbo XT is PC compatible, and some other x86 or x88 systems, like some of those made by Apricot, I guess, using the same line of CPUs just aren't. But anyway, at long last, let's move on to the expansion cards. To start with, we have a hard drive host adapter, which eats an IRQ and DMA channel, as well as living on port 320 hacks. And now all the things we covered in the 286 video make sense, don't they? There is no IRQ14 to live at on an 8-bit expansion bus like this. And my older 286 is biased, whilst the machine does have the 16-bit bus and second 8259, doesn't assume the hard drive will be anywhere but where it was on the 8-bit machines. This card, though, is a tiny bit unusual, because it's an IDEXT interface, also called XTA, 
and XTIDE and a few other things. It's essentially an 8-bit implementation of IDE and it uses different signalling, meaning the two are not interchangeable. And yeah, this also means it is different to the XTIDE cards you get now that will go in 8-bit slots. You couldn't just use the ROM from that with this and plug compact flashcards in. It doesn't work the same way. So far as I know, the Tower Drive uses this interface, but with a different connector that carries power as well as data. I think it probably inherited that from the PS2. I mean, it is made by IBM. The drive itself is 21 megabytes. It's made by Western Digital. It's pretty worn out, so it might break down soon, but it's a novel thing. And with MFM being so expensive, I figured I might as well pay the same for this with all the parts included and at least have something a little bit different. The PC doesn't know it's different because it just looks like an MFM or RLL drive to the computer. Uh, PC check seems to be aware that it's IDE, at least there, but not here, so... Uh, I don't know. Another advantage of using this in here is the fact that these drives have relatively low power draw, as the smaller 63 watt power supplies really aren't cut out to run big 5 inch hard drives. The original IBM PC got around this by using an expansion chassis which essentially just extended the IS Airbus into a backplane in a second PC case complete with its own power supply and you could put the hard drive in there. Amusingly, the later IBM AT had the opposite problem with its bigger power supply where you had to install the resistor dummy load in the hard drive bay. Basically, the PC just had a small inefficient heating element in it to stop the power supply from being underloaded, so don't start on me for wrecking the environment and not being eco-friendly when it's perfectly fine for corporations to mass-produce shit like that. Why perf copper wire when you can perf a solid core steel wire? To be honest, uh, I don't mind this, it's pretty neat. You can stand the cables up out the way while you're working in the machine, and they're probably a lot easier to solder if we ever have to repair something, so yeah. Much easier to solder solid core wire than it is to solder stranded, especially that modern stranded shit that comes from China and just feels oddly wet and not really very coppery. It, wet is the only way I can think to describe it. It's strange stuff. I call it never tin. Solder doesn't adhere to it. And modern solders made it never melt, because it never melts. Fuck knows what they've done. Took the lead out in a big part of it, but... Ugh. Yeah, this is better, even if it is cheap and technically crap. It's not as efficient, but... Yeah, who cares in something like this? IDEXT was actually introduced after the 16-bit version, and it does one or two things differently. One thing I really like is that it seems to auto-detect the hard drives. You don't have to change any settings to switch to a drive with radically different geometry. It just works. You can only install one drive per cable, so to add the second one, you need that other header populated, and you'd put the second drive on there. You do have these little... 2x3 jumper blocks which look like the master slave and cable select ones but they're actually not they fiddle with other things on the drive really everything's just automatic in that regard why it took so long to get that onto 16-bit IDE I don't know because even by the mid 90s it's an option you have to manually play with and isn't always reliable the auto detection I'm not sure how much work the EEPROM on the card does you'd think it's just hooking interrupt 13H and we actually did look at that with Lame Guy 64 and, well, yeah, the one thing I did find interesting looking in there is actually where you can see the video cards. You can see the CRRO reading right to left for the VGA card on my 286 versus the F FTREMOLO on the XT. And the reason being that the CGA card and monochrome cards don't have their own BIOS chip, whereas the VGA card does, and so obviously that ROM has to exist somewhere in memory, and, well, that's C treble O. You can also see below where the drive controller host adapters are hooking, where well, that's different. That doesn't make sense how that's F0, uh, it really shouldn't be, so I'm not sure what it's doing. Anyway, the shape of the card makes me think it might have been sold uh, in a hard card configuration also. I've not seen one. I did consider hard cards for this PC, but I couldn't find any working ones. And in any case, I don't know if this card came from that. 
it's more likely they just designed one type of PCB to do all of the jobs. I mean, why would you make a completely new design for the not a hard card version? No point. Goes without saying, this system didn't come with a hard drive or this card. It was just the one 360k floppy drive, and that was that. And well, it was quite a common configuration for these things. It it would do the job. It just wouldn't be that glamorous about it. That was what you could afford. It had to do the job. Not like you had much of a choice. Next up, it's that multi-IO card. It's another thing the system didn't come with. Though, being a DTK card, it probably is the one they sold for it. This gives us another LPT port and two COM ports, as well as the game ports. The other thing it does is provide a real-time clock that I don't have the right size battery for yet. It's 3032s, I think this would use. Uh, yeah, that's right, the system doesn't come with that capability. You would have had to enter the date and time at every startup with the clock running entirely in software or else referencing the 18.2 something hearts timer and not necessarily being very accurate. I mean, you can reference the, the PIT, but it's, yeah, it's not very high resolution or anything, it's not very good. And it isn't like you have anywhere to store the time when the system isn't running. I, I mean, obviously, otherwise this card wouldn't exist. The eventual standard stuck the RTC up on IRQ8 and I think addressed 70 to 71 hex. This one doesn't and there's no real standard so it lives at 2C0 hex or 340 hex. There were other solutions available such as those that lived on an interposer between a ROM chip and its sockets or even those that lived on the floppy cable. Yeah, I bet that was fun, though I guess these have the advantage of saving the expansion slot potentially, although, well, we're getting more functionality for the one we have using a slot, so I guess it depends on what you wanted to do with the machine. To, really, if you're ever bored, look at old PC magazines from like the 80s and stuff, and you would just be amazed at the sheer variety of wacky hardware that you will find for sale in them. There's just all kinds of stuff. In any case, you have to use software to both get and set the time, and it's pretty weird to think then that you can have a different time in DOS to the hardware system time, which is probably why some utilities run a test for both. I mean, DOS will just go back to 1980, whatever, regardless of this thing, unless you run a program to read the time out of the real-time clock chip. Otherwise, this thing really is a pretty standard I.O. card, and it uses the same parts as just about any other one prior to them going single chip around the end of the 80s. One thing you really do want to be mindful of with 8-bit cards, I mean, this RTC one not so much, because I, I can't think of any 16-bit machines you'd put this into, but I mean... Well, I mean, it is a 16-bit machine, but I mean, you know, 16-bit ISA. But still, some other cards, video cards, all sorts, they protrude into that space you can see over there. You won't fit this in a 16-bit slot. It doesn't matter with this particular card, but obviously that ain't good. Could be a problem. It's fine in here, on the 8-bit slots. It just barely fits over the top of where the ICs are. Uh, something to think of, and some cards even did leave cutouts for it, as you can see with that one there. But some of them don't, and uh, yeah. Just be mindful of that if you get into really old uh, ISA cards, because if you don't pay attention, you order something like that, I guess you might have a problem fitting it in your machine. Just something to be mindful of. I mean, early on, I guess they just didn't car. Like, they hadn't thought of 16-bit slots yet, so... It wasn't even a consideration. This is 1987 though, you'd think they'd have figured it out by then. The floppy controller controls floppy disk drives, internal and external. It's pretty boring. It looks just like IBM's one, and it might have been one of their parts, if not an extremely good replica. Uh, I do have some thoughts on this. It's worth mentioning that you actually set the number of drives on the motherboard, which is something else we'll, go, we'll come back to uh, soon. We've talked about the AdLib clone in another video. It's still doing AdLib things. Not very many things on this PC use it that extensively, though. I mean, there's little incentive for me to upgrade to a PCM capable card like a Sound Blaster in here. Whilst it technically would work, it'd sure tank the machine hard to use it at all, and they have faster computers for doing that kind of thing. There just isn't really any need. Now, that said, I think my TV remote is probably a faster computer than this thing, Although, maybe not as fun. 
Lastly, we have the CGA card, which might be a TMC card. I don't know, but it's definitely made by the same company that did the Hercules clone I have. And it's an older CGA clone, as is just evident due to its sheer size. Compatibility isn't great on this one, but it's no bigger. Again, I have other PCs if I run into issues, so we'll just let it carry on. The system actually came with this MDA card, which is purely monochrome text, and like most of the original hardwares, either an IBM part or a one-to-one -one copy of one. To be honest, the date codes on everything that I suspect as much are quite close together, and I wonder if maybe somebody gutted a 5150 to keep this machine going, or... To be honest, whether Dow products were dealing in e-waste and just cobbling these together and reusing parts, which it wouldn't actually surprise me that they've been these clones have been known to relabel ICs and stuff. So I wouldn't be surprised they were sticking used floppy drives and video cards in. In any case, it was quite common to see these cards on such systems, even very late on. Though I do have reason to suspect that this particular machine used a multi-monitor setup at one point with a second card. And that, that is a thing, you can use a, a colour video card and a monochrome card at the same time. You could totally use like an EGA and a Hercules card as far as I know. This is the sort of thing you should do in uh, like newspapers and stuff for editing those. Now you can of course use EGA and VGA cards in this machine as well, the, the performance is quite poor and later cards might not work very well as with my 286. I've come to suspect there's some kind of size limit for BIOS ROMs on them before the system just doesn't read anymore. Now as it only reads so much, observes the checksums invalid before it's read the rest of the ROM because it doesn't know to do that, and then won't try to execute what code it's read as a result. You know, I mean, obviously, it's, it's not going to be a valid checksum there, so it's not going to bother. It's like, oh, this is bad, ignore it. Of course, it's also possible that some video biases use instructions that don't exist in all the 16-bit CPUs. The video system really is a, a bit of a, a thing with PCs, because it, it wasn't very pretty early on. And to be honest, it, it's kind of a strange thing. I mean... When you think back to those companion chips on the motherboard, the 8288s, the 8253s and whatever, the numbering sort of at least suggests that they belong with an Intel CPU, and yet you'll notice on the CGA, MDA and HGCs, it has this other chip, that's the CRT controller, it's uh, a 6845. And it's a Motorola part, and 68 doesn't sound much like it belongs with an Intel CPU, because it bloody doesn't. That's a, a Motorola part, as we said, belongs with a Motorola CPU. Yeah, it's a bit funky there, isn't it? And remember when I said there was a whole load of different subjects we could go off on tangents for hours about? And this is certainly one of them, because, well, IBM did consider using various CPUs in the PC, and I wonder if this thing's left over from that stage and they just kept it around because it was doing the job. It's kind of funny, I, I do wonder what the proportion of these was that was sold into PCs rather than machines running Motorola chips. I mean... Yeah, I don't know uh, what PCs use the 6800 out there, like, as in, you know, microcomputers and stuff, not PCs per se, but, uh, I don't know, but, mm, <laughs> it would be quite funny if the vast majority of them were on uh, Intel platforms. I mean, this is all well and good, because up to now we've only worried about TTL video, but you could do composite on CGA, cut cut on mine. And uh, yeah, we have that little thing down there, this is when we were talking about the master clock, and well, yeah, the PC's 4.77 MHz is really weird, because the original CPU was rated for 5 MHz, and they only ended up at this clock because the master clock was easily divisible to get the color burst frequency of NTSC video, and that would leave the CPU running at this speed. And you see that little capacitor down there, that variable capacitor? You might have to turn that with a plastic screwdriver if you're using composite CGA, or else the color won't come in properly or at all. And it might crash the machine when you turn that, so that's something to be aware of if you're playing with this and you're not getting color out of a composite socket. Of course, again, this really is a CGA issue, and I only have one card that does that, and I'm not using it in here, but... Uh, yeah, and... Uh, don't bother on the EGA cards, because unless you have weird expansions for them, you generally don't get composite out. It doesn't hurt to try. 
Oh, also some of them output Y and C separately on uh, two sockets. So it really is a shit show of nothing really being quite standardised. I'm glad we ended up with VGA. It's just a much better technology than this stuff. <laughs> it really is. Now, whenever we want to change the video card type, we'd have to set up the dip switches on the motherboard. There's two of them. The XT machines don't typically have any setup program or any ways to store such things. So you have to do things by either small number of jumpers to set the RAM count or else these dip switches that tell the system how many floppy drives it has, what video card it has, what mode to run the video card in or whether there's an FPU installed. There's also a factory test mode I haven't played with it doesn't seem to do much of anything interesting. Yeah, there's no control alt escape to enter setup on here. These are your setup. There's no configuration for zero floppy drives either. There are one, two, three, or four, and an error condition on startup. It's rather funny then, perhaps, that such error conditions are more verbose than the mere numbers that appear on original IBM systems. The BIOS was a big hurdle for building a clone at one time. It was really about the only part of the PC that IBM fully owned. And in almost no time at all, the clones had much more capable ones like this to their name. Unfortunately, I think my one has compatibility issues. It should be possible to use the original IBM BIOS or most any other clone BIOS on this board though, as the designs hadn't deviated that much. The IBM one might be a problem as I think it has overclocking detection and so it would know that the system was 8 MHz and could possibly refuse to run. But hey, I wouldn't want that BIOS anyway, it sucks, give me the clone BIOSes. And I mean, even the clones didn't bother writing their own biases in the end, because you had companies like AMI and Award and Phoenix who just license it. And that was real convenient. You know, oh, we want to build a clone system, let's just license a bias from them. They'll sell it to us, we just stick that in our motherboard and have it fucking work. No worry about licensing issues or nothing with IBM. And we'll leave them to worry about the legal hurdles. That's their problem. We, d we didn't have anything to do with it, we just bought the product. So leave us alone. And now we return to the keyboard problems. Now you might remember I mentioned it before and it won't bloody work because they're what we call AT keyboards are what we ended up on and these are much the same as later PS2 keyboards and I'd not be surprised if large parts of the protocol remained unchanged in USB ones. I don't know though. I've not looked into that because I don't really give a fuck about USB keyboards. They're fucking boring. None of these will work on XT systems in any case, which need XT keyboards, or do they? Well, you have a couple of main options here. You can spend lots of money on some usually terrible keyboard for an XT system, spend probably even more money on a slightly better keyboard with a mode switch that can be used on XT or AT type systems, or finally, use an adapter of some kind which might be cheaper. Because I'm cheap and most of the keyboards were shit and expensive, I employed the Key Defiddler to handle this problem and let me use just about any old AT keyboard to do the job. Yeah, those will work fine with a PST keyboard too, and in theory it might work with Schizo USB ones that can plug into PS2 ports. The cost of this device was under £5, because it's made from garbage and a PIC675 chip. The PIC series of chips goes all the way back to the 70s, so arguably this is an era-appropriate solution for these systems anyway, given the PIC chips existed before the PC. I don't know about the 675, I think that one came out in the 90s. It's not running code that I wrote, it's someone else's, and I'll probably put some links in the description. And to be honest, I like this, because, I mean, there's other solutions out there, a lot of which are overly complicated, inefficient crap, with their own Unix-like OS running on fucking ARM CPUs with HD video capability. That's not for me. I rather like the PIC solution and its ability to run right in line from the keyboard port. It draws only a couple of milliwatts of power in cars, basically no latency. It doesn't need any extra cables or anything other than the one that goes between it and the PC. This for me is the solution to use for this problem. No need to overcomplicate things. It does its job just fine. Had no problems with it yet. Well, that isn't the only adapter we need, as we also require the Video Bastardizer Mark IV to handle the video signals. This is a new version, 
which is essentially a modified design from H2 Obsession. I found it whilst looking into both the plain diode clamp version I had before, as it seems he built an air identical one, and while searching for potential conditional logic to improve on it. H2 Obsession had already done the work, so I made some minor alterations and got it assembled, and well, how does it work? Something like that. In my case, I'm using one of the otherwise unused exclusive OR gates as a NOT gate to optionally reverse the H-Sync polarity. You see, the CGA card I have actually outputs negative H-Sync, or would that be normally high instead of normally low? Where CGA usually has positive sync for both H and V. As well as XORing to get composite sync, we need the polarities to be the same. To be clear, we could just invert the V-Sync instead. It doesn't matter as long as they either both are positive or both are negative. Should get reliable composite sync coming out. Curiously, the older monochrome cards had their sync set up like this CGA card does. And I have to think they probably did it this way for compatibility with older monochrome screens. You see, most CGA cards are positive sync both ways, or they're supposed to be. In any case, I'll leave a link to H2 Obsession's design in the description, and here's my schematic of it if you want to copy off that. It'd be well that his, I think, has an issue with one of the pins on the 7.4 LS86 where I'm sure it uses the wrong pin for something. But you just check the data sheets if you're going to try and assemble this thing. Whatever, anyway, it's a simple enough thing. So let's start the machine up and see what it does. The hard drive sounds old and beat up, but then I don't think this machine's exactly going to thrash it all that hard, so with any luck, it might last quite a while yet. The purse screen's rather basic, it's really just copyright strings and memory count, plus any of the error conditions it can display if such problems are present, or at least if the machine thinks they are. Then there's a rather long delay as it spins the floppy drive and perks the hard drive and seems to do practically nothing for a million yards. Personally, I think it just has a bunch of things going on with the boot process. I mean, for a start, I guess the hard drive, the host adapter has to take over. I really don't know how much that does. It, most of the electronics are on the hard drive. It's the thing with the auto detection you'd think been, should be there on 16-bit. Integrated drive electronics, the hard drive is doing all the work, the card's doing very little. But it could be something to do with that, or it could just be DOS. Maybe uses a light form of compression, has to be decompressed to RAM on boot. I don't know. 286 does this as well. In any case, we get to DOS 5 after what's really only a brief rate. I did consider using something older like DOS 3, but couldn't really find any advantages to doing this, only a bunch of disadvantages. So DOS 5 it was. And that's it, there's no TSRs running or anything, it's not like there's anything going on in this machine to need them. There's just a utility to sync the OS time with the RTC, that doesn't stay resident, and that's about it. Also, the clock seems to be running a bit slow. Now what? Oh, well, it's productivity software for these, lots and lots of that stuff if you're into it. Almost any of this is written in the 80s will still run on an XT, although not necessarily very quickly, just because they were so widespread at the time. It really isn't all that fast a lot of the time, and if something uses a graphics mode, it's probably going to drag its heels pretty bad about doing very much. It'll work, and it'll do just fine. You can get the job done, and you can totally use it, but it will make you appreciate those early 90s machines that can do it with comparative ease, and usually in a much better interface. The slowness does have its advantages though, as some older games don't have their own timers and simply run at the system speed. These will run, 
too fast or run strangely on later systems, but they run fine on an XT like this with the turbo off. You can see here how this is, how it becomes unplayable on a faster system. There are a handful of issues though. Some games that I'm told should work on here don't. Given this is the internet, people might just be wrong about what they've written or else my system has compatibility problems, but some of them are known issues. For a start, I know this CGA card has issues and certain modes don't work properly. It's also very, very snowy, by far the worst I've ever seen. The clone bias on the motherboard might also be the cause, as we know from my earlier 286 that certain features aren't entirely watertight and they do strange things or fail to work as they do on the IBM original. And it's also worth noting that these video cards like CGA that don't have their own bias and use the system bias can actually behave radically different sometimes from one machine to the other. In any case, some programs will just freeze the system and do nothing. You really are limited to 80s games, and even those start to slow down as time goes on, or do they? I mean, stunt car racer we do need to use an EGA card for, and the game's a little bit slow, but I think it's impressive how well it does run at 4.77 MHz. Weirdly, if you enable the timer, the game won't only run smoother, but faster than it's supposed to, and a few others do the same thing. I wonder if perhaps they fiddled with the system timer somehow to make the machine look faster than it really was when running on a store shelf. But if they did, I would expect the program interval timer to be affected, as in the PC speaker would surely sound weird and it doesn't. Peculiarly, this behaviour is much less likely with the RTC card installed. This almost makes sense when you think, well, it has a higher resolution timer and everything, until you remember how it's wired up and that it isn't using the standard address and everything that an application might expect. So I don't know what that's doing. In any case, I wouldn't really want to venture very far into EGA on a machine like this, with Prince of Persia being a great example of why. In CGA, the game runs passably with only occasional slowdown and a bit of input lag. And this is all with the turbo on now, of course. But in EGA, the game seriously shits the bed at the slightest thing, as if it wasn't already bad enough. I hadn't played this game in years, and I honestly forgot what a shit show it could be. Oh, I like this game, I really fucking like this game, and I'd rather play this than stupid bloody broken Tomb Raider, but good god is it a busted mess sometimes. I have to run an earlier version on the XT because the sound doesn't work in later revisions and that seems to be by design, but this earlier version has issues with keyboard inputs, so I have to play on the joypad. And it's not really great for this game sometimes, especially not with the lag. By contrast, my 2865 is a bit better on a later version of the game, but that can't detect the joypad inputs properly, and it has similar sound issues to the XT, only now kind of the other bloody way, and we have similar keyboard input issues in the older version. Ledge Suit Larry is also busted on all PCs, as it seems to get stuck in what appears to be a composite CGA mode, which is no use to me, because my card doesn't have that, and the one that does upsets the game for some reason, and it still won't bloody work. And it doesn't seem to matter which PC I've tried this on, it isn't just this XT, and, well, it seems Sierra released a broken game, who would have bloody thought, again, I fucking love Leisure Suit Larry, but... Sierra's coding quality wasn't always the best. They did make some pretty silly decisions from time to time. I guess it sort of doesn't help just how varied and not set in stone the PC market was at the time. Captain Comic is one of the few EGA games that will run decently well on the XT. It's just a tiny bit slow and the controls do lag a little bit sometimes, but it's fairly consistent and you sort of get used to it. You can play it from start to finish with no serious issues. The only real one is that if you want to use a joypad, you have to use version 5 of the game, which features different, less appealing music, and is even missing some music entirely. This is because the joypad code in earlier versions locks up the system. Michael Denio seems to have been aware of this issue, as it is mentioned in the README, suggesting it's not just a niche issue with my particular machine, and probably you just used a 186 instruction there or something, I don't know. You could probably just about push Duke Nukem 1 also, a game which I'd argue is aged better than Keen 1, but it would be a bit painful at times, I'm not sure you'd want to go through the whole thing. I wouldn't usually run this kind of stuff on this machine, and to be honest I'm only doing it here because we want to see how far it'll go. 
really we're best sticking to off-brand CGA titles. Uh, this Pac-Man game is actually not that old, but it's really quite nice. Even this old Breakout clone is okay when it works, there's not much variety, but it's perfectly playable. And Yeah, it's not just the uh, hardware they were cloning, it was the arcades as well. Speaking of which, by the time we do get to the Mario-inspired Keen games, we're at the upper limit, and I'd really not want to play this on this machine at all. We're really only bringing it up here to show you how things scale, and, and also to add some context to why I find the 286 impressive. I mean, at a whole 25% lower clock, a machine from 1985 plays a game from 1991 quite competently for the most part. It's, it's generally passable at that kind of thing. And when's this Turbo XT from, anyway? Well, it's a 1988 machine. And yeah, that's right, the same year that Lisa and the Tampon machine came from. At the time this one was made, the 286 was still something of a luxury for quite a lot of people, and just on the edge of becoming viable for the home user. Many homes and businesses kept going on these slower 8088 systems because it was what they could afford, and it did do the job, it just didn't do it as quickly. 8088s would continue to be sold going into the 90s, though of course by then they weren't selling anywhere now as well. Still, how does this performance actually scale? Well, with the Turbo off we get really exactly IBM 5160 performance, which is pretty good, because that's something I wanted with such a machine. I got it in part just to see how honest the XT requirement on games like Stunt Car Racer really were. To be honest, we're not actually seeing 5160 there, are we? But we're seeing this uh, BT branded Zenith. Howdy, Brassic Gamer. And you're probably thinking, well, uh, you're lying because he gets four points and you get three, but I think that's just Top Bench being funny because if I add this into the database, it does round up to four. Of course, the total numbers aren't really the same. You will see variants in things like video memory, but. Uh, your CPU is going to be a bottleneck before that's a problem on these machines. I wouldn't really worry about it. It, it. They all work about the same for the most part. In any case, compared to the 6 MHz 286, we aren't doing so well, but I mean, that's a higher clock, isn't it? So, I mean, you know, what are we getting? 4 points versus 10? Yeah, uh, well, I suppose we can turn the turbo on on here. Go up to 8 MHz. Still slower than the 6 MHz 286. And with the 286 at 8MHz, there's no chance that that thing's going rocking it up to like 13 points. That thing's more than twice as fast as this 8088, so you ain't going to catch the bloody thing. It's not going to happen. Very impressive CPU, the 286. Very underappreciated. I mean, if that doesn't state why I find the thing bloody impressive to behold, then I don't know what will. In AutoCAD 2, with no systems using FPUs, Again, the XT just has no shot at catching the 286 whatsoever. Even with an FPU, I'm fairly certain a 287 would clobber the puny 8087 every time. To be honest, I'm not even making graphs or anything for AutoCAD. It's so slow. I'm just going to tell you in minutes that the Turbo XT is going to take well into double figures of minutes to render the tablet at 8 MHz. The 286 at 8 MHz is probably going to do it in about 7 or 8 minutes. Oh, and the graphs we showed for Top Bench, those were made on the Turbo XT using SuperCalc 3. So if you're thinking they look a bit weird, well, there's your reason why. I thought it would be pretty cool to have it make its own graphs. It's, you can see the performance still isn't really fantastical, is it? Hey, this Turbo XT could be had for under $300 in its time. Where a 286 would have cost double, and a 386 would have run you well into four figures. And this is before you consider the other things you'd need, like monitors and God knows what else. For what it cost, it did its job, and it probably did it as well as it ever needed to. And that was good enough, or at least it pretty much had to be. Sure, it's really not a pretty machine, and it's not very impressive in the performance department. It's ugly, and it's big, and it's cumbersome, and it has its troubles, it's not perfect, and you can just sit here and complain about it until the end of time. But I think these Turbo XT machines were instrumental in getting PCs into the home for the average person. And they played a huge part in opening the doors to the white box components that we hobbyists love to build with. For all its flaws, I have to respect this system just as I respect the flawed 6MHz 286 for those very reasons. 
I mean, you can see when we reference the price list, they're selling components, and they're only selling them to businesses. But it was only a matter of time before a distributor is going to turn around and be like, if we sell these to the hobbyist, we can make more bloody money. And you sure as shit don't see IBM branded PCs around anymore. And I think that says something. This thing's got a legacy that it left behind, or these machines in general do, and it's not exactly a fucking small one. In any case, I don't really have much else to say. Well, actually, I have a million things to say, and we could be here for hours, but this video is probably getting on for one hour as it is, and I think my lungs are about to collapse, so I'm going to fuck off and find something else to play with, and then maybe I'll be back someday. Definitely got to get an 8087, though, because I wonder at what point CPUs start being able to outrun it. So there we go, that was my Tarbo XT, my Dow Products DTK motherboard using off-brand white box one. I quite like it, not the most practical thing, well, depending on what you're trying to do. I mean, if you want to get into these, be aware of the caveats, it's not as easy as playing with like a socket 7 or a slot 1 machine or something. In some ways it may be easier, but yeah, they're, they're a bit of a... Even for me, I used to own a 5150 and I forgot a lot of the specifics. Another thing worth mentioning, I heard people, CPU Galaxy, I definitely remember, said like he couldn't get uh, AutoCAD 2 to run. I know he's not the only one. I had that problem, it said so about the DOS environments and suitable, and I was like, is there an invalid setvar entry, or do I need to make one? Well, all I had to do was rem out the setvar entry in Config Sys, and it worked. There was no entry for it, so I, I don't know what that's about, but that made it work. So maybe try playing with that if is anyone out there wants to get that running. Uh, upgrades on these things, you can definitely make them go faster. Uh, they did boards like where you could put a 286 on a card. I'm fairly certain the Ancient Electronics and probably Adrian Black has one of those. Uh, you can also, the cheapest and easiest is probably to put an NEC V20 in. I don't have one, I don't want one. I think Nintendo has one though. Comme vous pouvez le voir, le NEC V20 est plus rapide que le 8088. Mais bon, seul un fou comme iTreason ne voudrait pas utiliser un tel processeur. Uh, yeah. Nice kind words from the guy. Now, uh, what else can we do with this machine? I'd like to do more in-depth videos on CGA and EGA and stuff. I'd love to get the monochrome cards working. I'd have to buy a monitor or a depth one because I can't do them right now. Unfortunately, people don't like selling things in this country, as I think I said, so we have, like, either they'll sell a monochrome screen as an EGA monitor and jam the price up, or what they'll do is they'll just, oh, it's unfavorable for me. So, well, don't fucking list it for sale if it's unfavorable. Well, I won't post it. Well, I'll arrange a courier. Oh, no, I can't do that. So do you want to sell the fucking thing or not? Like, if I can get someone in the United States or something to pack stuff in a box and send it halfway around the world. Why is this such a problem for you in this country that I'm going to pay my mate who has a fucking van to come and bring the fucking thing to me? Like, I don't know. It's, it's a thing on this continent, I swear. And I've gotten really sick of it. And I'm sick of a lot of things. I mean, what does this year hold for this channel? I couldn't tell you because it's a bastard to work on now. Like, I can't just take files from this uh, capture software, which just seems to be a reskinned OBS. We can't run the original one, because all the workarounds seem to be for fucking web applications in the browser. And the problem with things like OBS, they output slightly broken files. They don't conform to the standard, and I can't read them in a lot of things. I can't use them in my video project, and it's never been fixed. And so I have to convert them to like raw AVI or something, and now I don't get thumbnails and shit on some of them for some reason. It's just hard. It's annoying. It's tedious more than hard, I suppose. Of course, it's my fault, apparently. I, I didn't write the software, but somehow it's, it's on me that it doesn't work. Fucking retards. I, I get sick of people taking that attitude. Uh, yeah, not fucking easy. Now, just, just irritating. Uh, Otherwise, I don't know. I've got more synth demos to do this year, so we'll get to them. We've got other hardware. I should probably start talking about consoles. I'm running out of PCs, but I've got plenty of PC-related topics I can get into. Like I say, it's just the editing. That's the, the chore now. I uh, feel like we're probably going to get sifted this year. We haven't been sifted for a few fucking years, so maybe I'll do something about that. Maybe I won't. I don't know. 
as we've established, most of the fun has gone out with this for me now because of the way modern PCs work, modern hardware, it's all fucking annoying. I've had my fucking fun, so I don't really care who I piss off and how many problems I cause at this point, doesn't really matter to me. So, you know, whatever, it is what it is. But this machine, I fucking like it, and I'm sure we'll see it again. I definitely want to get an FPU. I gotta figure out, I'm sure I can disable it like while it's in the machine because it will degrade integer performance. I think I can do it without butchering the machine. I've been reading the data sheet. Always read data sheets, they're really interesting, you learn a lot of things. Uh, so we're looking at that because I want to know at what point can the CPU outrun it. Can we outrun it on like a 12 MHz 286 with no FPU? Will we need 16 MHz? Will we need like a 25 MHz 386? I don't know. I need to test this. And I don't think they're that expensive. I'm sure I can get one. So that's going to be nice uh, and pointless because the only thing that uses fucking auto well super calc uses it but I don't know I'm going to use that a lot. <laughs> I think we'll go back to PowerPoint for that one I'm afraid. Maybe, maybe we'll do it on this occasion. Might redesign the channel graphics this year as well. I don't know. Depends if I can be bothered. I kind of like the ones I've got. I'm just thinking about it. It made my mind up yet. But anyways, yeah. I can't tell you when I'll be back. Whenever I'm in the fucking mood, and whenever I'm not busy, or sick, or don't have other bullshit fucking appointments to keep with this and that, and just a million things getting in the fucking way. So, I don't know. Am I treason? Uh, I'll see you next time, whenever it may be, and whatever it may be about. Thanks for watching, as always. And remember, until next time, don't be a screw up, load DOS 6 to it. We're on DOS 5 today, I don't know. Uh, get your jive on, put DOS 5 on. It, it was a bad idea, I knew I shouldn't have started down that fucking road. You know, I knew I'd forget stuff, because I always do, but it's pretty simple stuff. I was going to mention with the benchmarks that my 286 actually it does have weight states on the memory, so we could actually get the 286 to go faster if we disabled those, which we could do just by shorting a couple of pins in the ISA slots. Actually, it does have a jumper for it, but it's essentially what it does. Um, there was a 286 version of the XT, but I'm not sure if it's an XT in name only, because I think it does have a KBC chip, so it might use the AT keyboard protocol, which I don't know, if anyone has one of those, then uh, by all means let me know. And uh, I think that actually had no weight states and was faster than the AT in some ways because of it. But I'm again not certain on that. I don't own one. I have like two 86s, but they're not IBMs, of course, because I, I deal with uh, you know clones and compatibles pretty much exclusively. So again, feel free to let, let me know. Um, it's, yeah, uh, you know, you, you're not going to catch a 286, but as we saw with the prices, value for money on this thing was pretty fucking good, and you can see why there's a lot of them out there. But they're, uh, you know, they, they were a, a serviceable machine and had some life left in them just because of the amount of XTs that were in use out there. A lot of software would still work, and yeah, I don't really think it was a, a rip-off. I think really by the time this one was made in 88, you maybe should have been looking at maybe waiting a year unless you needed the machine instantly or something. I, I think we're really coming to the last couple of years where you could really sort of expect to do anything magical with this. But I mean, you would at least have an existing library of stuff that you could use on it. So I don't know. Uh, hard drives I meant to mention as uh, holes, if you have one of these, look in the bottom of the, the chassis. I, I've, I've got other machines like this. I'm not actually using that because my hard drive mount is real thick and only that one side, that's all I have. And it doesn't rattle or anything, so I'm not that worried. I'm, I'm not in a hurry to make that look more elegant. I don't have screw holes in the bottom. I can drill and tap some. If I, I, I don't care. It doesn't matter. You know, It's, it's not a big deal, but... Yeah, it's a, it's a place to look if you're, you're missing some where to put the screws, or if you have one you can't get a drive out, then, yeah, the screws are in holes at the bottom there, uh, which, you know, like I say, it's worth keeping in mind. I, I think that was it. I'm sure there was something else, but, well, maybe, maybe not. I guess we'll find out. 
but I'm, I'm done with this one. I think we should do at some point, a lot of my machines have changed a far bit since they had their own videos and I think at some point we should do you know, an updated systems video, we haven't done one in a few years, just to catch up on how those things are now. When, you know, a lot of the videos are done when I first built the machines and you know, you sort of change things as you go along. And most of them I've settled fairly well on the configuration that's in them. So, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll maybe have a look at them sometime. Yeah, and I still have synth demos to do, I know, and I, I want to get them done. I've been trying to get this set going. I've had uh, to replace the power supply of my Presler, and it was shit, so I had to replace it again. Uh, weird Seasonic supplies not made by Seasonic and they're not brilliant but they're not awful. I think they should be more than good enough. And so hopefully, and I've just modified one of my synthesizers to make it much easier to work with. But it is something for another day. And as I say, I'm, I'm really done with this project now. I want to get this out because it's been a long time and I just want this one done. You know, I've, I've had my fun working on it now. I want to go and work on something else so i'm high treason thanks for watching and i will see you in the next one hopefully not too long this time but i really can't make promises as much as i wish i could